This Week in Pediatric Oncology, the podcast exploring hot topics and exciting advances in childhood cancer. TWIPO is produced by Solving Kids Cancer, nonprofits located in New York and London, dedicated to improving research and supporting families, because every kid deserves to grow up. Subscribe to TWIPO through your favorite podcast platform. This week in Pediatric Oncology, the podcast about new advances for childhood cancer. Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode number 100. We've reached our century mark. Recorded during Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, September 7, 2022. I'm your co-host, Tim Cripe from Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, affiliated with The Ohio State University. And I'm here along with my co-host, Brenda Weigel from the University of Minnesota. Welcome, Brenda. Hi, Tim, and hi, everyone. A pleasure to be here for the 100th episode. How amazing. Thanks for joining me today. You know, we had talked earlier, we wanted somebody really famous, really impactful to talk to on this 100th episode, and and we got it. So today, we brought in two people who many of you have heard, but maybe not have seen their faces. So if you're watching on YouTube, or you can see their faces, put a name to a face. If you're listening, you could always you hear their voices, but you can flip to YouTube to see them. So that is Scott Kennedy, who's the co-founder and executive director of Solving Kids Cancer, and Donna Ludwinski, the director of research advocacy for Solving Kids Cancer. Welcome, Scott and Donna. Thanks for Thank being- you, Tim and Brenda. It's a, it's a thrill to be here. We're super excited to join you guys on this special occasion. Thank you. And Donna, thanks for being here. Thanks, Tim. It, it really is a landmark moment. It really is. This has been a long running uh, event and super excited about what you've crafted and uh, continued to create. Well, I appreciate that. We wanted to talk about uh, TWIPO and this podcast and also other things as well with you. Uh, you guys have been really instrumental in in uh, launching it and making it a success. So um, you know, thanks for for all you've done. Of course, yeah, thank you. We couldn't do it without you guys. We thought uh, maybe we'd start briefly with the history of how the podcast came about. I'm sure you guys will recall that you asked me to do a webinar uh, that explained some of our viral therapy science, and uh, I had so much fun doing it that, and I think that was the first webinar I had ever done. And uh, you know, the technology was clunky back then; we didn't have Zoom, et cetera, but uh, you did a post webinar survey and asked people if they'd like to be interested in in a in a recurring podcast. And I think something like seventy or eighty percent of people said yes. And the reason I was interested in doing it was all about science communication. You know, I never felt like us scientists communicate or or us physicians communicate science and medicine very well uh, to people outside of our colleagues. Um, we all tend to talk and techno speak and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, that was really your having me do the webinar was my sort of first foray into saying, okay, let's take these complicated ideas and explain them in a way that other, you know, that most people can understand. Hopefully I was able to do that, but um, that was sort of the impetus behind, behind this whole thing. And uh, here we are, what, 11 years later and a hundred episodes later. Well, Tim, tell us a little bit about your inspiration of some of the other podcasts you listen to. I know that in the early days, you shared uh, a couple of podcasts you listened to on double speed while you were commuting. So you need to share that. Yeah, that's true. I I got hooked on podcasts right before we ended up starting this one. Uh, the one that I tuned in the most, as I mentioned, I do viral therapy. We use viruses to infect and and kill tumor cells, and now we use them to as gene therapy vectors as well. So I had was trying to understand the field of virology better, and landed on a podcast called This Week in Virology, and it was really fascinating. They they actually stuck to it every week, so they've done you know hundreds, if not thousands, of episodes. I actually haven't tuned in in the last few years, but uh, I modeled it after them. But as you recall, after I pitched that idea, the three of us spent a lot of time. So, sort of pitching or or digesting or or discussing different uh, you know what the purpose of it would be and what the format and and how we wanted to uh, go about it and so you guys were very instrumental in helping us launch that but yes I I always felt like I needed information fast 
And so, you know, my commute wasn't that long, or if I'm riding the bike, I don't ride that far. So I always wanted to get as much information in as possible. So I was delighted when I found on our smartphones, you know, we could speed these things up and listen it. If you go, I found if you go 1.5 or 2X, the, the tenor of the voices isn't too odd and you can still understand it. And uh, what I found very odd is you get used to people talking that rate. And so then when I would tune in at, at normal speed, I felt like they were just talking like this. So you really can get, if you don't make it too fast, where they're going, then you can get a lot of information in a shorter amount of time. That's great, Jim. Well, you know, I'm a little bit of a data head. And so I wanted to share a few stats on Twipo. And so far, we've exceeded 80,000 downloads. Um, and nearly half of those have been in just the last three years. And since our virtual meetings have kind of taken over, we've launched the webcast version or uh, video version, which is really exciting to see the additional views there. So people are tuning in all over the world. And guess what? Top five countries are United States, Canada, Australia, UK, and Germany. But we're also getting viewers from Nepal, Fiji, Uganda, Qatar, Iceland, Romania, Vietnam, Peru, and Iraq. So it's super exciting to see that's a small sample of the 103 countries that make up our listening audience. And so I, I really feel like it's a, a it's truly an example of a global enterprise. So super excited about the attention we've gotten. It is amazing. I think in large part due to you all promoting it. And so we appreciate that. Uh, it, you know, when I think about a teaching, uh, when we teach classrooms, you know, or, or students, it's usually in small groups or at the most a lecture hall of, uh, well, I usually do graduate students, so it's usually only 15 or 20, but, you know, undergraduate courses may have 100 or a couple hundred. And you're talking thousands and thousands around the world. I mean, it's amazing the reach we can have nowadays with this kind of platform. Yeah, so I'm just thinking back to the early days, Tim, when you were still at Cincinnati Children's and I think you carved out a space in your office, sort of a ad hoc recording studio. And I think you were doing the editing yourself and um, you had the guests come in person. Um, so that's pre-pandemic. And I'm just curious, since those days when Tripos evolved to where it is now, what do you think about, you know, the past versus the present? Do you, you know, have any things you missed from the old days or are you glad we're at where we're at now? That's a great question. You know, I think one of the original motivations for, for doing the podcast was we would often have journal clubs and say with my lab or with the fellows. Uh, and, and sometimes it would be in the office or, or in a small conference room. And we would be discussing a paper. You know, we'd go in depth in the paper and we might read about it, if it was like a really seminal paper, you might read a newspaper article about it. And what struck me was these articles just didn't capture near, you know, anything close to what the total paper was it, it was just a highlight and there's pros and cons and strengths and weaknesses of of every research study and and these weren't captured in in the the publications that you might read in the newspaper so part of the idea was let's record ourselves having this conversation about the paper so that others could hear what we think as the strengths and weaknesses and and maybe they won't they'll they'll realize that you know it's not all um, rainbows and puppies and that the newspaper might make it sound like, but it's, there's, there's a lot of nuances to the science and we need people to understand the shortcomings and have more realistic expectations of the progress that we're making or the limitations that we have as scientists. So it made sense to just sort of set it up in the office to record these discussions. So originally I got a sounding board, a, a mixing board, and I had everybody with different headphones and microphones on and um, trying to you know, get the sound all all correct and then feed it into my computer. And yes, I would edit them myself. You know, Don and I worked hard to select the music at the beginning and the end. And I think there was an episode where you explained about that, that your son had created, but I would splice those together. And then the other thing I would do is I would delete out all the ums and ahs and oohs, all the odd, you know, turns of phrases and things. So I would actually go through the 
the voice pattern and I could recognize, I got pretty good at recognizing an um or an ah, and I would, you could using these easy off the shelf or, you know, down publicly available uh, softwares could just cut those out. And so I would go through and cut them all out so that we would sound very smooth as we talked. And um, there's an um, see, uh, so you wouldn't have heard that in, in the original uh, sets of ep episodes. Nowadays with these video recordings, et cetera, that's impossible to do. And frankly, probably was overzealous and not needed, but, uh, and then it, it ended up taking me a fair amount of time to process each episode. So it was a little burdensome. So I appreciate nowadays that it's much easier and that you guys are handling all of those logistics. You were also known to be able to take Twippo on the road when you attended a conference or a meeting. And if you saw a presentation or a potential, you know, great guest among the, the peers you were with, you would grab them and, and you know, have an instant kind of podcast. Um, I think that's that was great. Do you think that that's something, you know, to look at again in the future or is it not as feasible to do now? Well, yes, it was. It was fun to do. In fact, the very first time I did that was episode two. I was looking back, you know, episode one, we sort of reviewed a paper about the epidemiology of childhood cancer. Episode two, I happened to be going to a study section at NIH. And I noticed that Greg Riemann, who had just finished his 10 year stint as chair of COG, was was a member of the study section. And so I emailed him ahead of time and said, hey, would you mind if I interviewed you, recorded interview afterwards? And, and he said, sure, that'd be fine. So after the study section meeting, we met up in the hall. You know, I hadn't planned anything or where to go or anything. So we, we found sort of a corner in the lobby of the hotel where we were having the study section. And we found a little table and two chairs. And I just set up my, my, my Mac. I think I had an external microphone that I would carry around at the time, but it turns out you don't need it usually with, with these good laptops. So uh, we just had the conversation in the hallway there. I do think there was maybe background noise and people walking by and so forth, but, and that was always a fun thing to do at, at meetings, but I also found it's challenging because we're going to meetings to be at the meetings and to go into talks, but I do think that's a good place to capture people. And we haven't, we obviously haven't had that many meetings with, lately with the pandemic, although they're starting up again, which is great. So we could think about doing that again. You know, for a time, uh, we I was limiting it to the people that came through to give talks at our institution. But the beauty of this technology these days is we don't need to wait for a meeting to capture someone. We don't need to wait for them to come and give a talk to my institution. We can just, you know, catch 30 minutes of their time at a random date and time. So it's probably not as needed, but it is more fun in person. Brenda, I'm going to turn it over to a question to you. Um, you were sort of a new part of the team um, in the last couple of years, which has been great. And um, just wanted to see, you know, it's not easy to jump into a co-host role with Tim having an established podcast and, and a rhythm and um, a way of him doing it. But you've made a perfect fit and an amazing synergy with him. Um, and you've even become somewhat well known. I know when you have gone to meetings, um, you're now well known as a podcaster among your researcher peers, which is really cool. So um, just wanted to hear from you what you think the secret to your good chemistry with Tim is. And, and additionally, what made you want to add being a Twippo co-host um, to your already full career and super busy schedule? Hmm. Uh Scott, thank you. And I want to just thank you and Donna for welcoming me to the team and um, giving me the privilege and honor of being part of this amazing, uh, amazing uh, legacy that um, is incredible within pediatric oncology. And I have to say, you know, with Tim, this was an a easy yes. And this started with, as Tim was just saying, I was an invited um, speaker at Nationwide Children's and I was one of the people who uh, was interviewed with the soundboard in a nice quiet room with uh, the headphones on and um, talking about pediatric drug development and something very passionate in my heart. But Tim, Tim and I go way back from our days of it, both of us very interested in rhabdomyosarcoma. So we have been connected um, now for well over two decades um, and collaborated and friends. And so 
It was an honor to be um, interviewed. Uh, and and I've known Donna uh, also for well over two decades. And so putting those two combinations together was that this was an easy yes. The other thing is, I would say this is a very unique opportunity to be part of something very special in the pediatric oncology, I would say, education landscape at a global level. I think, as Donna, you just highlighted how big the reach is, how big the global reach is. I think it's also an opportunity for us to really highlight all the amazing things that happen in this field and the breadth and the depth. And so for me, it was just a tremendous honor and opportunity to be part of that and to be part of highlighting amazing colleagues and achievements around, around the globe in pediatric cancer. So just, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I cannot believe it's been over a decade that this has been going. And um, and I can't believe as well that this is episode 100. Um, and I can only imagine that each of you have a few favorite moments or a few favorite episodes or topics over this last decade. And I would love to hear what each of those are for, for each of you, those kind of maybe pearls or nuggets over the last decade that stick out as real special. Maybe I'll toss it to Tim first. Yeah, there's so many moments, I think, uh, because it's been really an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to interview and talk to so many different people. I was going back through the list of 100 today and just reminding myself how many different leaders and uh, people of impact that we've been able to talk to and hear from. And it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun uh, and, and really interesting. I think the, the episode that, that strikes me or that I enjoyed among the most uh, was with B Lampkin. So B, it was episode 21. She was sort of a leading lady uh, of, of pediatric oncology and was at Cincinnati children's and uh, for decades and decades. And, you know, really in the era of very little technology, very little understanding of cancer biology. And, you know, she told stories in that episode about doing daily bone marrows on patients to try to assess, you know, are the cells dying from the chemo and uh, told stories about what it was like to be a woman in early years of medicine and to have polio and I don't remember if I didn't go back and listen to it. I don't remember if we told stories about her, but the, <laughs> the, the, the stories that used to circulate were that if you were on rounds and you got an answer wrong, you might get a good swat from her crutch. But, um, you know, those were the days you could <laughs> do things like that, keep people in line and well-educated, but she was, she is, uh, she is a, you know, a fantastic, uh, person advocate was, was long after her official retirement was coming in to teach the fellows uh, microscopy skills, looking at bone marrows and so forth, and really just uh, a huge personality in the field. And just hearing all those old stories was so much fun. Oh, Tim, it's so funny you picked that one because that was one of the ones I wanted to highlight um, because her story and her own personal success and and you know a triumph was absolutely fascinating um, to hear. And then recently we did the one with uh, Dr. Jonathan Finley, who reflected on his career. Also, very poignant references to you know frustrations he's seen and you know issues like oncologists neuro-oncologists going into industry instead of uh staying in the field so that so it's really really interesting you picked hers um one of the ones that i really liked is episode 20 um and that was with patrick reynolds pat reynolds and andy cole was on that and also uh joe mcdonough and they were talking about the f word in pediatric cancer, which is funding. And I thought it was a very provocative episode because there was a lot of data presented in terms of uh, compelling reasons to fund more in pediatric cancer. So I, I just thought it was a really, really, uh, you know, you know, really stimulating conversation and, and really great 
great episode. So I, I, I thought that was, that was great that you picked that one. And this one was really compelling to me. Going to have to go back and listen to all of them. <laughs> I know. I know. They're so I good. To go back to. <laughs> and I remember, Donna, when, when um, you were asking me to do this, you sent me a link to go back and look at those. And it is a treat to look at the earlier and listen to the earlier ones because they're, they're audio, but, but it's amazing. And the history is amazing. Scott, what are some of your favorites memories? Yeah, no, um, a more recent one. I, I really liked, um, I listened to it a couple of times just because I couldn't get enough of it, but it was, uh, with Dr. Michael Taylor, from Sick Kids and Nabil Ahmed from Baylor, Texas Children's. You know, they had a very specific subject, which was uh, an immunotherapy um, approach for um, for medulloblastoma group three. So it was um, it wasn't such a broad subject. It was focused on a, you know, like a very important clinical um, translational research paper that came out. But what I thought was great about it was it just had a real it was two people that were um co-authors so that was interesting and they just had a great sort of personality um and a good banter between the two of them so i thought it was um just a refreshing um episode to listen to because of their personalities and and the way that they used that to highlight the work made it seem really exciting um and then i was just thinking back you know fondly and nostalgically, even though there were hard times. It was during the pandemic when we um, we put together kind of a hybrid webinar, which became a podcast, uh, where we had a colleague of, of Tim's from, from uh, Nationwide, which is Jeff Oletta, and he was a real leader in talking about the pandemic and the impact on the pediatric cancer research landscape. And I think we were really early in the game to um to highlight this this area um and so it was really innovative but also just comforting and important and i think important at the time where we also assembled you know dr oletta's leadership but we had different stakeholders i think we might have had four or five guests who represented different areas and so um and we also invited you know patients and families and um and a lot of different stakeholders to come to it so I think it was um, a really good, important, I guess I'll call it service to the community to do. And um, I remember feeling just very comforting and um, comforted about it. And also that we were adding value, you know, in real time to um, informing people and, and having them have a voice for discussion. As, I'm glad you mentioned that one, because I do think it was important, impactful and timely. And Jeff was able to take all the concepts that were discussed in that episode and organized them into a manuscript that we all became co-authors on and was published quite quickly. And I think, again, during the pandemic, it was helpful to, to get something out quick with all those ideas in it. And it was a, uh, he, he did most of the writing, but um, it, I think that the idea was on a Friday, hey, let's turn this into a, a paper. And he had a draft distributed to everybody by Sunday and submitted by like Tuesday and accepted for publication the next Friday. It was some really crazy accelerated process. And it just shows you, I guess, uh, you know, the eagerness or the hunt, the appetite for that sort of thing. We've all spoken about the impact of these communications, these podcasts, but that's a small sliver of what, what you guys do is uh, in, in your foundation of solving kids' cancer. Tell us about sort of what drives SKC and what your motivations are and what what you know you feel like your success other successes have been because we're the ones supposed to be asking the questions of you our guests i mean i'll take that one first it's um uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about it you know really obviously what drives us is the fact that we're parents who have gone through this um but we're also trying to be nonprofit leaders in the same way you know not just uh, emotional parents who are raising money and trying to fund our local hospital, we really want to, you know, try to be strategic and, and, and approach it the right way. So, um, you know, one of the key things about SKC that we um, wanted to do from day one is to really um, direct the work that we do to where the best science is and the best people to carry that out. 
you know, to be objective and agnostic versus um, supporting our our home state or our the group of um, the group of researchers and clinicians that that treated our children. So, you know, this focus is super important because in order for us to feel that we can make impact, I think we have to try to find um, the area of the greatest unmet need and focus there instead of, you know, more of a shotgun approach where we're just um, supporting many different projects, many different types of cancers. So for us, it's um, to focus on what we think are the worst of the worst, the poorest outcome cancers, you know, whether our children had those or not, we're all in the same boat. Doesn't matter what type of cancer it was in children, but we really do want to zero in on those, those really difficult players, those high risk cancers, because we can see the impact because, you know, you're starting from a super low survival rate and the work goes into it to increase those by, you know, hopefully double digits. That's where we really want to focus and distinguish ourselves. Yeah. And uh, honestly, it's very similar to the kind of the philosophy behind TWIPO in that is being aware and mindful of that entire landscape. Um, we, we really want to stay tuned to what's going on and be mindful of, you know, what are the pressure points? What are the high impact arenas uh, that we can get involved in as funders and as advocates? Um, so it's it's really exciting to be um, part of this endeavor in a broad range of really trying to, uh, again, maximize our impact. Everyone wants to do that, but uh, we're trying to be very mindful of that. As you think about sort of next steps for solving kids' cancer, TWIPO, what do you think some of the major things that, that you would like to see highlighted or major projects that you as an organization see over the next several years as being priorities for solving kids' cancer um, moving forward? I'll just go off of what Donna last mentioned, which is, um, you know, the area of research advocacy, which is a difficult term to understand. But some of the things that would be great to feature in the Twibble podcast would be some of the efforts that are bearing fruit that um, are really um, not well highlighted necessarily in the scientific community or in published papers, but really um, starting to get traction and making impact. And the approach that they're taking to not only convene multiple stakeholders and use a strategic working group as an effective means of improving, you know, the, the enterprise of, that we're all involved in. And, and, and I think that, um, to share some of those voices and some of those outcomes is good to not only inform the community, but to inspire some hope as well. Um, and I think it would also meet one of the goals we have, which is to attract and identify and perhaps you know train or mentor new parent leaders and nonprofit leaders that want to take the reins to um, you know, join this and, and create a bigger critical mass, and also to um, you know advance it into the next generation of, of leaders, so that um, we continue to have a, a seat at the table, which is important. So that's what I would want to see with the TWIPO specifically. So that we have our marching orders. <laughs> yes, I was going to say we 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 will strive to deliver. That is for sure in this huge team effort. I think as we come to the sort of close of our 100th episode, I would love to hear kind of final thoughts from each of you about kind of what these 10 years have meant and um, these 100 episodes and things that you would like to highlight that haven't been maybe mentioned yet. And, and myself as the new person to the table can just say, for me, the major highlight is being part of something that has such tremendous reach and such opportunity to cover the breadth and depth of topics. And I think, Scott, building on what you just said, for me, it's sort of, yes, let's bring that lens of discovery, science, advocacy um, forward into the next hundred episodes. And so thank you for the privilege. And so I will turn it back to hear any final thoughts. 
Well, Brenda, I love your question because honestly, every day I think about the renewed sense of optimism there is in the field. Um, every meeting, every opportunity um, that exists literally speaks uh, optimism. And I think that optimism wasn't necessarily like so pervasive, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, I, I really think these are exciting times. And I feel like, you know, the the brilliant minds and hands at work are are definitely making progress. And um, it, it, it makes it, you know, an exciting field to be really part of. So I, that's that's my view. I think I can't imagine what it was like in the days of um, Beatrice Lampkin and you know early days for Jonathan Finley and others uh, pioneers in the field when it wasn't so so rosy. Um, it was it was pretty gloomy. So I think we're very fortunate to be in a time when things are are really looking up. Yeah. So. Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you guys. And, you know, what I think I welcome is the continuation of the the tone and the setting you bring to Twippo, meaning that you are casual and you're in inspiring good conversation. It's not so formal with the guests. So I think people are relaxed and perhaps we can hear some insights that we wouldn't normally get with a different format of, of this podcast. Um, and also that you're open to different guests coming from different perspectives within pediatric cancer. So it's not just Don and I today, but in, in the past, you've welcomed um, other parents, other nonprofit leaders, a variety of, of voices. And so to give them the, the microphone um, and a voice, I think is really important. So while we do need those high profile leaders and scientists to be on this podcast. I think it's great to have a the diversity of, um, of those backgrounds and perspectives because um, we all want the same thing. And I think um, having a forum to share all these voices really, it's hard to measure the impact, but I know it's there. And um, we hear things from people talking about how great the podcast is from a variety of people. Um, whether it's lay people or professional people. So I think to get in the field and have impact and awareness from so many different stakeholders is super important. And I just appreciate you guys um, running the ship, steering the ship, guiding the ship in the way you do and want to just congratulate you and, and wish for continuation in the way we do it. Well, thanks for all those great thoughts and comments. And I appreciate the the support and you know, in response to Brenda's question, what comes to my mind is yes, we've we've had a lot of uh, exciting times. As as Donna said, it's a an exciting time in a way. I mean, if you think about all the advances that have happened since episode one, we didn't have CAR T cells, we didn't have bispecific antibodies, we didn't have a lot of different targeted therapies, we didn't have genomic analyses to guide targeted therapies. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on of the advancements that have made, and to be able to have a part in helping people understand those and, and gain advocacy about those uh, and the need for, for more research has been a real a privilege. And circling back to what Donna said about the reach and the different countries that, that Twippo's reached, um, it reminds me of the episode we did, I think it was 59 with Dr. Qureshi from India and how startling I was, was about, or how startling it was to hear what sort of care there was like and conditions there. And so I think not only do we have biologic challenges, how do we, you know, uh, what are the, how do we make better therapies? How do we reduce side effects for, for patients that can have access to the best, but how do we get access to everybody else around the world to the best kind of therapies? And so there's, there's plenty of challenges yet ahead. So I think we have at least another hundred episodes in us so, but you guys don't have to, we don't have to wait to 100 for having you back on again. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it looks like that's it for this week and our 100th Twipo episode. Thank you so much to 
our Solving Kids Cancer leadership in Scott Kennedy and Donna Lewinsky. And thank you to my co-host and inspiration and founder of this week in pediatric oncology with the initial podcast, uh, Dr. Tim Kripe. Thanks to the entire team at Solving Kids Cancer, a nonprofit charity dedicated to improving survival through creating novel treatment options for children. Remember, the more we learn, communicate, share ideas, and work together, the faster we'll reach the day when all childhood cancer is preventable or curable. As always, keep up the fight, and thanks for listening to This Week in Pediatric Oncology. We welcome your comments, questions, or thoughts on topics for future episodes. Just drop us a note at twipo at solvingkidscancer.org. You can follow Dr. Kripe on Twitter at kidsonkdoc. Send an email to Dr. Weigel at weige007 at umn.edu. And find all Twipo episodes at solvingkidscancer.org.